Dr. Tina, Dr. Tina Delisle is a Chamorro historian and associate professor of American Indian Studies at the University of Minnesota, where she teaches courses in critical Indigenous studies, global comparative Native studies, Indigenous feminisms, and heritage studies and public history. Tina's recent book that's very hot off the press is Placental Politics, Tomorrow Women, White Womanhood and Indigeneity under US Colonialism in Guam, published by University of North Carolina Press. Um, Tina's also co-editing a book on Indigenous oral history, which will be coming out with Routledge in due course. And I understand uh, that you've got a book project examining the contested sites of heritage and conservation in national parks and monuments in Micronesia. Now, before we hand it over to you, um, I'll just let I'll just say a few housekeeping words and uh, hand it over to Helen to introduce herself. Um, but just please, if you could put your um, sound, if people could put their sound, turn their sound off um, while Tina is speaking so that we don't get any interruptions. Uh, Tina will speak for about 40 to 45 minutes and then we'll have lots of time for discussion and questions. Uh, so um, I'll now hand it over to you, Helen, to whatever. <laughs> um, thanks very much, everybody. I'm Helen Gardner speaking here from Wadawurrung country at, in um, uh, south of Melbourne. And um, I'd like to welcome you all. My job really is just to do the technical side. Jackie and I have been working on these webinars together, but Jackie's um, done the bulk of the work. So welcome everybody to the Deacon um, uh, Zoom and really looking forward to hearing the presentation today. So please take it away, Tina. Thank you. Hafa Gay and Sijus Masi, I want to extend a donkalu and Sijus Masi to Pacific History organizers, especially Jackie Lecky and Helen Gardner for the invitation and for the opportunity to, to share my work. Uh, today, I'm, I'm, I'm really going to be drawing heavily on, you know, on the book uh, that, as, as Jackie mentioned, uh, came out earlier this year. The book is, is, a, is a history, is a gendered history of pre-World War II tomorrow women laborers under U.S. colonialism in Guahan in the Marianas. I focus on the work of nurse midwives in Chamorro, the term is Sia, more commonly known as the, as the patera, and that's uh, the Chamorro word that's based on the Spanish term for midwife partera. I'm also going to be, uh, but the book also looks at teachers. For, for my presentation today, I'm really going to focus on um, the midwives. Um, and if, um, if, if there's time in the q and I'm happy to talk about uh, one of the other Chamorro women, women uh, Agata Johnson, who was a very prominent teacher uh, in the early 1900s in Guam and, and post-war as well. So the book focuses on the patera and uh, teachers, and these were some of the first Chamorro women to confront and negotiate U.S. colonialism in the early 1900s because the U.S. Navy's uh, three-pronged project was, was uh, public works, pub public health, and public education. The book, Placental Politics, as you can see from the cover, also expands and complicates the histories of Chamorro women by examining their labor as enmeshed and entangled in the early 20th century philanthropy and feminism 
of white American Navy wives and nurse, nurses stationed on the island. The questions that I uh, set out to, to, to um, explore and answer, um, this is the image of the, the uh, early 1920s, 1930 photograph of nurse wives and um, 1916, 1970, 1917 photograph of Chamorro women teachers recruited by the Navy. The central questions that I'm interested in is what is the historical and cultural legacy of Chamorro women confronting, confronting the, the legacy and work of white Navy women and Navy wives in Guam? What do the historical dimensions, causes, consequences of these intersections between them, of, of the intersection between them reveal about Chamorro women's work? What does the prior history of Chamorro women's work in relation to the work of white American Navy women in Guam reveal about new ways of being, enacting, and performing what it means to be Chamorro? And what might an indigenous feminist critique of colonialism offer to moral decolonization and sovereignty struggles and the rematriation of indigenous land and life, especially in the context of an increasing US militarization and destruction of Chamorro homelands in the Marianas of which white military women continue to assert their role, their place and role in the gendered violence of empire Settled colonialism and cultural genocide of indigenous peoples. Some images of some of those, uh, um, the protests and rallies back home around Chamorro decolonization, um, an image of uh, what you know, recent images of what's happening with the US military buildup in Guam currently. And this is an image uh, when I when I when I talk about the role of women, not only historically, but um, uh, in contemporary times, the, the role of white military women, but I shall also add brown women to military women as well. And this is an image uh, the change of command between uh, Navy Rear Admiral Betty Bolivar and um, Shoshana Chatfield, all during the, the, the US military buildup. In the book, I foreground Chamorro archives, Chamorro women's oral histories, unpublished writings, and Sinangan Famalawan Samoro. Sinangan Famalawan Samoro. Chamorro women's stories. To argue that in the gendered landscapes of 20th century US colonialism in Guahan and American Navy whites efforts to transplant elite white womanhood, Chamorro women reworked new mobilities and freedoms from indigenous patriarchal proscriptions around gender and place while rearticulating new forms of womanhood and inafat maulik the state, a state or condition of making something good and right, something that's constantly being worked on. So uh, I wanna emphasize not stable, uh, but constant, that's constantly being worked on. I'll return to this Chamorro concept of enough of Malik shortly um, and give, uh, give a little bit more deep detail and depth. These new modes of womanhood in enough of Malik comprised an emergent modernity different ways of enacting and performing indigeneity in relation to American practices without necessarily abandoning indigenous knowledge and belief systems, particularly those underscoring the importance of Tano land. In tracing the development, the historical development of Chamorro women's embodied land work and what I call an indigenous feminist politic, uh, excuse me, an indigenous placental politics, Women in, enacting and employing, employing ancient knowledge and sacred practices like the burying of the placenta or in Samoro, Gatsung Putgun, the child's companion. I am specifically marking the idea of distinctly native and gendered forms of being modern. To be sure, placental politics as decolonial history 
is my bid to advance the critical indigenous feminist project of decolonization and anti-colonialism, keeping in mind, as Tanana Athabaskan feminist scholar, Diane Millian reminds us that to decolonize means to understand as fully as possible the form, the forms that colonialism takes in our own times. Placental politics, politics contributes to the dearth of historical scholarship on Native Pacific Islander women and gender and indigenous feminist theorizing of history and culture. An intervention in Pacific history, Micronesian studies, Chamorro studies and critical indigenous studies in which feminist critiques of colonialism and militarism remain scant. It builds on the work of indigenous oceanic feminist scholars and activists deconstructing the still seemingly unmarked stable and neutral category of white women feminists and their complicity in empire and ongoing colonial and settler colonial sites. And um, I'm really thinking here of um, uh, the work of um, Australian indigenous Gompo scholar, Aileen Morton Robinson, and over 20 years of talking up, and I'm referring here to her, her um, couple years ago, her celebration of the, the 20 year mark of her initial publication in 1990 of talking up to the white women. I'm also mindful of the really uh, rigorous and scholarly debates coming out of Pacific history uh, around the challenges of doing women's history. Jane Haggis's critique in 1990 of uh, women's history and the well-intentioned project of centering women in colonial contexts, a project, however, that often entailed a problematic salvaging of their experiences, which failed to historicize white women's complicity. And then, um, uh, you know, many other debates, intellectual debates that followed since then, much of those coming out of colonial studies in Australia. Margaret Jolly, in response uh, to, to um, you know, this critique of, of women's history, offered, has offered the metaphor of the maternal body as a critical concept for rethinking white women's roles, analyzing how the historical maternal body involved the mobilization of Victorian ideas, including true womanhood, as fundamental components of the colonial project, as demonstrated in colonial health policies and in how Native women and women were feminized and infantilized. For Jolly, the metaphor also crystallizes the multiple subject positions and subjectivities at stake in white women's and native women's complex participation in these imperial projects. In a critical response to Jolly, Aileen Morton Robinson has argued that in the attempt to articulate, to excuse me, to complicate and historicize the nuances of women's roles in the colonial project, Jolly equalizes the fundamental differences between white women and native women's differential and uneven positioning to colonialism and thereby underestimates the historical and political relations of power between the two, while also misconstruing and therefore eliding the specificity and difference of indigenous women's perspectives and lived realities. Morton Robinson's contention is that maternal body, is that the figure of the maternal body is incommensurate with the historical experiences of indigenous women who not only do not regard middle-class white women in Australia as mothers, but who insist on white women's direct implication in the ongoing legacy of racism and sexism, assimilation and domestication, land dispossession and stolen children. White women in Guam, as my book argues, must uh, historically and in contemporary times must similarly be held accountable to colonialism Although there is no denying the affective ties, which imply Chamorro complicity with colonialism and kinship with the colonial new woman agent, and agents like Susan Dyer, the American Navy wife Susan Dyer, and Helen Paul, two new woman Navy wives who are the subject, uh, who are actually the subject of two of the chapters in my book. So placental politics for me is an indigenous feminist project of recentering Sinang and Famalawan Samoro, Samoro women's stories, 
publicating Tomorrow Women's Histories, examining and problematizing colonial native entanglements, interrogating the terms of indigeneity, which, much not, which, which is not stable and which, which must never be taken for granted. And, and these are the kind of arguments that have come out um, in native Pacific cultural studies. It is also interested uh, in the time-honored feminist tradition of marking the unmarked white women's subjectivity and white feminism. And what I call uh, white women's tour of, du du uh, tour of duty feminism. This particular subjectivity and form of progressive white womanhood, what um, again, what, uh, tour of duty feminism in the tropics stemmed from unsettling feelings of being constantly relocated and reassigned either as wives of, of husband officers or later as laborers, nurses and teachers under contract with the Navy. This deconstructing of white feminism or studies of the, of the non-indigenous as Sisseton Wapaton Oyati feminist scholar Kim Talbert puts it, is always, quote, in the service of indigenous self-determination, end quote. I want to turn now uh, to uh, Susanna, to, to Susan Dyer a little bit too. Before looking at uh, the work of uh, the Patera, the nurse midwives, I'm gonna turn uh, briefly to Susan, Susan Dyer and, and, and the Susana Hospital. Um, I, I know that um, uh, Anne Hattori is here today. Uh, she's done some wonderful work, work that has looked at the gendered landscapes under the US Navy's naval policy and has written about the Susana Hospital. Now, before I, I um, do that, I actually want to, uh, to give some uh, a little more historical context to the Navy's public health project. Shortly after the Navy's arrival in Guahan in 1899, the Navy commenced an aggressive public health campaign. Naval governors ran into challenges because of lack of federal government resources, money, and labor. And so the Navy began actively recruiting Chamorro women to train as nurse midwives. In colonial accounts and even local historiography, the US Navy's public health system has been lauded as one of the island's biggest triumphs. In this narrative, the conscription of Chamorro women is engendered teleologically as the outcome of progress through modernization, which in Guahan, as in other US colonies, as the outcome of uh, progress through modernization, uh, excuse me, which in Guam, as in other colonies, is synonymous with Americanization, which in turn is understood as, as indigenous acculturation and assimilation into American values, ideas, and practices. In this colonial narrative of delivering Chamorro's unequivocally, uh, excuse me, in this colonial narrative of delivering babies properly, the certified Chamorro nurse midwives, the Patera, were regarded as delivering Chamorro's unequivocally, unequivocally into American worlds. The colonial mission and colonial discourse that justified the relentless Americanization and acculturation required that these women themselves be properly delivered from the clutches of traditional or lay midwifery. These nurse trained midwives were being trained precisely to replace their elder predecessors, the lay midwives. The paternal and patriarchal rhetoric of bringing Chamorro women into the political and social folds of the United States under the dominance of white American military men, of course, downplayed the violence, the complexity of Chamorro women's labor, as well as disavowing the critical role that white women filled, filled in, it, in efforts to assimilate the Chamorros. So I wanna turn here now to Susan Dyer's work. Um, and, um, and tour of duty feminism. The regulation of Chamorro uh, midwives, the, late, uh, the, nurse, the nurse trained midwives um, trained under the Navy as well as the lay midwives had already been um, underway by the time Dyer arrived in Guam in 1904, starting with Governor uh, Seton Schroeder's 
uh, order the uh, order in 1990 that required lay midwives to become licensed after completing courses in um, elementary gynecology and antisepsis uh, and, and doing so in English, uh, followed by uh, his successor who, who mandated annual licensing. But the Navy's campaign escalated dramatically with the opening of the Susana Hospital in 1905, which laid the groundwork for systematic and regimented instruction and training and the recruitment of off-island white women Navy nurses. Including members of an elite team of nurses known as the Sacred 20. Susan Dyer dubbed this labor and leisure fundraising, the, fund, the fundraising and establishment of the, of the Susana Hospital, the first hospital for tomorrow women and children as small matters compared to her governor husband's official big matters. Dyer's so-called pet projects and tour of duty feminism informed by, early, by, by her earlier feminist networks in elite New York, uh, New York circles, which actually included um, intimate uh, audiences with uh, influential women like Susan B. Anthony, were of course anything but slight and insignificant. These white women's small matters did matter. And, and uh, in fact, all, all of the women I interviewed in the 1990s um, received, had received their training in the Susana Hospital. I wanna, I'm gonna turn now to Chamorro women negotiating the terms of US colonialism and look more closely at this embodied land work that I call placental politics. And the idea of placental politics as indigenous feminist history, theory and practice, as gendered in Afat Malik. That term again, uh, the, the meaning that gendered uh, in Afat Malik is the state or condition of making something good or right. Can I ask uh, how I'm doing on, on time, Jackie? I've got to unmute myself. Um, you've got about another <clears throat> 15 minutes. Okay. Is that okay? I think that's, Good, that hopefully will work. <laughs> Let me know of the, maybe the five minute mark. Okay, yep. The inspiration for articulating a theory of indigenous placental politics comes directly from how the Patera, in defiance of US naval orders to burn or discard the afterbirth, regarded as toxic medical waste, continued ancient practices like the planting of the Katsung Patkan or child's companion, and the Apuza, the umbilical cord, or they would allow family members to do so out of respect for the deep symbolic and cultural meanings that connect notions of self to land and community in a system of reciprocal kinship relations and stewardship obligations. The potential in placental politics is an indigenous feminist inspired theory and anti-colonial practice of being in action informed by Tadung, deep ideas of self in relation to land and the primacy of stewardship of land amid enduring colonial transformations. What figures prominently in these sacred practices of embodied, highly visceral land work and gendered in Nafat Malik is the role of rooted and routed women, midwives, healers, educators, godmothers, Magahaga, literally that uh, refers to uh, the high ranking daughter in ancient Chamorro society, but it's all also used a term used to, to describe Chamorro women leaders, uh, as well as Manietlo sibling relationalities. Placental politics names a history and futurity by which indigenous women have consciously chose to act as stewards of Guahan lands, waters and skies, Chamorro peoplehood in place and kin and more than human kin. I'm also interested in how the social and cultural histories of indigenous women's placental politics and gendered in Afat Malik, their de determinations to maintain a Chamorro sociality as it relates to land can inform ongoing land back struggles in, a, in the new colonial landscapes in Guahan, elsewhere in Oceania and beyond. A system of values, ideas, and feelings that Chamorros collectively and as a people consider good and essential, in Afat Malik denotes balance and is based 
on mutual assistance, cooperation, reciprocity, interdependence, obligation, respect, peace, and reconciliation, which has direct implication for, one, for how one behaves, uh, behaves in relation to familia, community, and land. These Tadung practices with their own connotations of substance and wisdom include um, gai respectu, having respect, fa tau tau, to treat someone with decency, gai mamahlau, having shame, mangingi, sniffing and smelling a saina or an elder's hand to take in their essence as a show of respectu or respect, and sensuli, which includes debt, but of a different kind, one that is tied to obligation. This Chamorro debt obligation um, nexus, Tensuri, entails a gift or payment to somebody in need as a way of creating and maintaining a form of reciprocal exchange and ongoing indebtedness. Tensuri is not based on capitalist economic notions of wealth and accumulation, nor the gift giving of benevolent assimilation, but debt reflecting interdependence and reciprocal community and stewardship obligations that come with, for example, uh, childbirthing and child rearing, and which encompass non-biological modes of reproductive labor, such as uh, pinexai, uh, it's a tremoral term uh, that means many things um, to, to raise someone to adopt, nurture and care for, but it also means, uh, it's also a term to use, uh, use to describe uh, paddling or propelling something like paddling a canoe. So I wanna share um, some of the oral history work uh, that I conducted in the 1990s uh, to help illustrate this gendered in Afamalik and how the Patera worked the Navy system, how the Patera incorporated naval methods with um, ancient uh, Tadung deep, Chamorro practices and how they handled compensation. As mentioned, colonial narratives and even local historiography have marginalized, has marginalized, if not erased, the complexity of Chamorro women's histories, including how women healers became important mediators, gatekeepers whose support or resistance to Western health services would determine community acceptance and compliance. A little late here in uh, my definition of, of central politics. Um, but I want to turn here to, uh, to uh, one of the patera uh, uh, that I interviewed for the book. Rosalia Yujoa Mesa, or uh, better known as Tan Lian. And um, a quote here, um, really key here is the way that uh, Patera were able to ease the tensions that many pregnant women felt about going to the doctor by helping them understand the value and importance of a regular checkup. Tan Lien characterized this assistance as maulik, and that's a, a key word, maulik, good. Um, at, at, you know, she, she uh, so let me read the quote. You find it very, very malik advice to the pregnant woman because you can spot the high blood pressure, you know, any symptoms like for the first three months and, and uh, for the second three months since, um, you know, and if you're look, thinking about hypertension and eclampsia, like eclampsia is, is it, it, you know, it, she's describing how it's uh, something you gotta be concerned with. And if you're swollen, um, and she's pretty much articulating to the women here that if, if we don't get a handle of these things ahead of time, you won't be able to deliver in the comfort of your home, own home, and I won't be able to have you there. So this is really key because um, throughout the naval, um, throughout na the Navy governor's reports, they're constantly complaining about how the, the pregnant women, how pregnant women are refusing to, to see the American doctors because they resort to their own methods. Another look at this in Afa, gendered in Afat Malik at work um, and specific reference here, I wanna call specific uh, your attention to the specific reference to Mamaha, 
shame. Um, and so, uh, reading uh, re reading along here uh, with with uh, Joaquina Babalta Herrera Tanquina's um, interview, and she she's she says um, she's telling them, "Why are you afraid to see the doctor?" And and then the patient says, "Oh no, I'm scared to see the the doctor on account of seeing my you know seeing her." Uh, and, and she says, don't worry about the woman. Don't worry about the doctor. He doesn't care for your, um, you know, your vagina. <laughs> um, I love, I uh, love these interviews with Tankina, by the way, because they're really colorful, right? Um, he cares, you know, and she starts to articulate that he's, you know, he cares for you. Um, he wants to make sure you're going to have a normal presentation. Um, but what, what she's really, what she really gets at is, trying to massage the tensions here for the uh, expecting mothers and, and again, reassuring them that if, if they avail themselves to the doctors for the at least the first trimester, that she's going to be able to uh, help the women deliver at home. And then she begins to articulate why there's, um, <clears throat> excuse me, why there's, there's this um, reticence on availing uh, themselves to the doctors, not only because Chamorro's uh, like other indigenous women throughout the Pacific who saw these sites, the hospitals as sites of death, right? Um, these women uh, were also mamalhau, ashamed of, of, you know, maybe the clothes that they had to bring with them to the hospital. A lot of women didn't want to leave their children at home. And, and she's saying, um, I don't blame them. You know, they're ashamed. Uh, so I'm, I'm giving them advice and, and it's for their own good. The contestations and tensions surrounding just how the patera handled compensation and money are also revealing. Though they identified the opportunity to earn money as a reason for entering the, the, uh, the nursing profession or to become a midwife, um, the reason for them becoming midwives, the patera often accepted other forms of compensation, produce from the ranch, or being named godmother. Um, now, as you as you can imagine, if the Navy is trying to implement a cash-based economy economy as part of a broader project of modernization and um, efforts to make Chamorros into productive wage earners, you can imagine that this is something that's really militating against the Navy's efforts. Um, you know, uh, get your your payment uh, being paid in godmother, right? Being being paid by being dubbed godmother or receiving um, produce from the Lansu, the ranch. Even if naval law stipulated a, a, um, that, the, that the patera could refuse delivery, and it actually um, stipulated a price. At, at one point, um, it had to be a minimum $10. Even if the patera got a sense that, um, you, know, it, you know, coming to the house and sensing uh, the family situation, they would never refuse a, a delivery, at least not the women that I had interviewed, because that would have been culturally, culturally inappropriate. Um, that would have been tie respect to having no respect or um, worse, uh, tie mamalau, having no shame. Under certain uh, circumstances, fat tau tau, that, that term that means uh, treating, uh, literally to treat someone as a human being, but um, to treat someone with de decency, uh, that also demanded that the patera in some instances uh, correct the situation. So for example, if she got paid and if she would see that uh, maybe the family had a lot of children and didn't have a lot of money, um, she, she would return the money. Oops. I want to uh, in this in this um, uh, some of you may have already read, but uh, but uh, Tanan is saying she recalibrates this value that's placed on uh, these uh, reciprocal relations between the mother and the and the midwife as as you know the, the, a gift that that comes from the heart. I want to uh, move now and 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 close uh, or yeah you know so, close my presentation um, 
with um, returning to, to the Gatsung Potgun, the placenta. The, the inspiration for my history of tomorrow women as a way of thinking about relationality or more pointedly, radical relationality and directionality. How the Pateras regard for the Gatsung Patgan, the friend, which in Chamorro, Gatsung, uh, Gatsung also, um, when, when you say Gatsung, uh, it's a friend, but Gatsung also means, um, you know, like when some has guy Gatsung, you, you, it also means you have a spiritual companion, right? So um, it's, a, it's a loaded meaning as well. But I want to return, um, return to that idea of, of uh, the Patera's regard for the Gatsung and, uh, res and respect so much so in affording it the proper, not simply burial, but the planting, either nearby the house, under the stairs, um, um, near a tree. They would wrap it up in a towel and, and bury it. Um, but how uh, that ritual involving the Gatsung under the Navy's radar, because they were specifically instructed to burn it, the women that I interviewed, um, suggest a re reciprocity, not only among Tamoros, and earlier I talked about Manietlu, sibling relationships and the centrality of that in, in, in the Patera work and in, in uh, the work of the other Chamorro women that I talk about in the book, but, but the relationship uh, between Chamorros and uh, more than human kin. So the relationship between kin, among kin, but also between kin and more than human kin. And I'm talking specifically about the placenta as friend. I think this idea of radical relationality really helps think about, um, you know, for me, um, helps me think about this. And this is something that um, I want to expand on uh, when I begin to look at um, the contested sites of, of na national parks and monuments and continued land struggles and tomorrow meanings, um, place-based meanings. I want to continue to look at, at um, what, could, what could be construed as radical relationality, but also rematriation movement. Uh, indigenous led women's movement that is about returning the feminine sacred to Mother Earth. Uh, to uh, that, that is throughout Turtle Island in, in um, North America, but uh, also seeing that within Oceania, um, not only uh, commitment to land back, but also certain kind of pra practices uh, with the land. And, and so much more expansive than, for example, the term repatriation, which, which we often think about as a legal term for thinking about the return of, 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 of sacred objects. So I want to read here this idea of ra radical relationality that uh, really comes from uh, Diné scholar Melanie, uh, indigenous scholars Melanie Yazi and, and Kucha Risling Baldi. And they describe it as um, the ethos of living well radical relationality, relationality, which is radical in the sense of roots or origins. And by that, they're really, they're, 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 they're referring to when we think about a starting point, oftentimes we think about a worldview and a human worldview, but what if we were to look at it from another point of view and thinking about um, uh, the, uh, the, their work is really about the politics of water relationality. Uh, so thinking about water view, um, and, and we can think about you know, some of the, the struggles in New Zealand in giving the river rights. Uh, what does it mean to give more, um, more, than, more than human rights? Um, so this idea of radical relationality. And this also represents a sense of dramatic and revol revolutionary change from our current epoch of power as in a radical shift towards decolonization we conceive of radical relationality as a term that brings together the multiple strands of materiality, kinship, corporeality, affect, land body connection, and multidimensional connectivity coming primarily from indigenous feminists. Kim Talbear, returning to Kim Talbear, um, she offers a similar framework she calls caretaking, an expression of obligations of human kin with our other kin, 
Other theories of relationality are simply inadequate, she argues, for capturing the vibrancy and the spirit of indigenous relationships with our, our non-human relations in these lands, largely because they sever materiality from spirit. This radical relationality, what has driven Chamorro women and what will continue to drive Chamorro women and their kin to protect lands and waters and skies and the revitalization uh, of many different practices, including the burial and the planting of the placenta, are the phys physical and psychological effects of watching military maneuvers over our children's gatsung and the bodies of our Manmokotna ancestors. Together, such images embody the historical and political forces and motives which, as Teresia Tewa speculated, have driven indigenous women across the Pacific to come to political consciousness, to imagine and enact indigenous futurities now, to take up activism after the bodies of their loved ones become affected and infected by large and previously mysterious, mysterious forces like nuclear contamination. I'll end there, thank you. Thank you very much, Tina. Um, if you could just take your slide um, slideshow down. That was fantastic. Um, <clears throat> it's given us a lot of, uh, lot, of um, lot to think about here and um, wonderful to, hit, to sort of get some insight into your new book as well. So we've got lots of time for questions and comments. Um, if people could either put your hands up physically or use the raised hand function on Zoom. Um, Helen will nudge me if I, if I um, can't see it um, and make sure you unmute yourself when you're going to speak. So um, please um, over to, yeah, everyone. Uh, you're all very shy. Tina, can you say um, you did your interviews in um, in the 1990s? Is that correct? 1990s and uh, early 2000. Has there been much of a change uh, in uh, recognizing? Um, I mean, amongst um, amongst indigenous midwives, but also the health health profession in recognizing. Um, indigenous health practices, uh, particularly in relation to childbirth since then? So I think uh, with, with regard to um, Ama Tomorrow, uh, Tomorrow Medicine, which many of the, which some of the midwives, uh, especially those who were um, Patera Surahana, they were, they were uh, traditional healers as well, and they used them in treating women. Um, there, there is, there continues to be a resurgence of that. And, and um, I mean, that has been, that, that doesn't happen as much in, um, in Western medicine, uh, but there is more as of a deference, for example, to incorporating some of that. Um, and I've spoken to some of the, um, some who have, you know, given birth, at um, in, in Guam, even in in clinics, um, they're able to take home the placenta, and and thanks to law in Hawaii, uh, Hawaii was the first state to actually allow families to take their baby's placenta home in in 2000, 2006. Uh, so so with that and the revitalization, decolonization movement happening, um, and resurgence of Chamorro practices and rituals, uh, you're beginning to see people uh, more amenable to that. Uh, but I mean, it's it's on the rise, but surprise, you know, not, not surprisingly, a lot of people don't know about the medicines or that practice. So very different to what we've had here in Aotearoa where um, recognition of the placenta has it's, it's been yeah it's been going on for a very long time. Oh yeah, absolutely. I know that um, you know some of my contemporaries have grown, in fact 
uh, said, oh, well, you know, we, we buried our baby's placenta. And that just was not a practice you know, when I had my children. Okay, can I um, open it up to a question from Margaret and um, uh, Arila, I think. We'll start with Margaret. Uh, Margaret, you're on. I haven't, I haven't unmuted. <laughs> Hi, uh, Chris. Hi, Tina. I'm talking to you from Gadigal country. I'm in Sydney. Um, so wonderful. I really look forward to, uh, to reading your book. And uh, could I just say that I think that this is really, you know, brought into frame a whole lot of really important contemporary questions about trans indigeneity and, and trans indigenous feminisms. And um, I do think that there's something really important about connecting women's bodies as mothers and the land in a way that that you've done. And I think that too often the kind of, um, if you like, the more sort of um, all of those um, interrogations of kind of women's stuff has been di disconnected from sort of land resistance movements in really in ways that I think Eileen Morton quite rightly suggested, you know, they need to be sort of in integrated. Um, so I think that really, um, you know, there's, and it's really important to see land, of course, in resistance movements, not just in kind of Eurocentric property terms, but in the way that you've described as, you know, absolutely, you know, the imbrication of a of, 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 of person and body and, and the land in notions like Vanua, as in Vanuatu, um, but also that in involving the whole spectrum of relationality, not just between persons, but with non-human kin. And I think that's come out in the work of, of you know, Tall Bear and, and uh, Carl White, of course, and Eve Tuck and, you know, various, and it's wonderful to see this conversation going on between Native American scholars and Indigenous Australian scholars. I suppose the specific question that I wanted to ask you, Tina, was about how important the militarization is because you have this same kind of, um, um, I suppose, perpetuation of an idea of being a modern woman in many contexts where you don't actually have, I mean, of course, colonialism always has a violent sort of military edge, but the kind of the significance of Guam as an, a US military base, I mean, of course, that's already been investigated by, um, by Anne, you know, in her book on on um, on on you know the, the the U.S. Navy, so you know what what difference does it make to have these white feminists as you know in, in tours of duty originally, you know, as companions and then ultimately as part of the U.S. Navy? What difference does that make to this being done by sort of a colonial officials, missionary um, sort of agents, etc.? So. You know, I, th I thought what you came to at the end about the kind of, you know, the horror story of all this military stuff happening over the, the bodies of, of um, you know, past kin and the, and, and the placenta. And I really liked that idea that placenta isn't so much buried as planted in, in, in the land. So sorry if I was a bit long, but uh, great, uh, great talk, Tina. Oh, thank you for that, Margaret. Not, not long at all. I really appreciate that engagement. Thank you. Um, the, the, the question about militarization, um, I didn't have a chance to talk about uh, one of my chapters on, on um, the, the Chamorro teacher, Agatha Johnston, who has uh, basically in the history books, in, in public history, she's, she's the, um, you know, the, the poster child of, of, of uh, Americanization. Mm. And um, her story is one of intense, fierce loyalty to America. Mm. And, um, and, um, and I tell that story and I try to complicate it. I try to complicate that story. Um, so so <clears throat> with the military, the difference here in the context of Guam has to do with the modernizing project under the military and regimented and the way that Navy women were put in very close contact because uh, with native people, uh, these these you know gendered projects of you know mm. teachers and nurses because of the lack of of resources, but specifically with regard to Guam because of the history of uh, World War II and uh, 
Americans coming, the return of America to Guam, the, the intense loyalty and patriotism and, and the kind of nostalgia for American, Americanization and, and modernization under America. Um, and, and, and this idea that modernization uh, for many could not happen anywhere else outside America. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what you're seeing now is um, that, that, that intense loyalty and, and, and gratitude to the, to, the, to the Third Marine Division, mm -hmm. uh, the return of the Marines uh, and the US military, you're seeing that um, being, being really taken to a hilt, right? I mean, it's just reworked mm -hmm. um, heavily such that um, you know people can't so so in other words this um, the the military the hyper militarization of the island now um, and the transfer of marines from Okinawa gets actually um, reframed as the 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 latest return of the marines right so mm -hmm. a reminder mm -hmm. of that intense loyalty. Um, but, there, but there is this other side to it uh, that I try to tell in this chapter, for example, in the chapter on the midwives as well, but, but probably especially on the chapter on Tanagata Johnston, who was, you know, again, she, she's, um, she's a Chamorro teacher who actually establishes, uh, you know, talk about, um, you know, an example of this gratitude and patriotism to America. Uh, after the war, she um, establishes the, the commemoration to, to uh, call, you know, that becomes Guam's Liberation Day, mm -hmm. liberation, um, Ameri you know, the, the Americans coming and saving Chamorros from the Japanese. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> um, Arietta was going to ask a question, but um, I see you've put your hand down. Um, Helen, can you see anyone yeah. else? Um, um, I was um, I would still like to ask a question if that's okay for Absolutely. Professor Dilil. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Thank you so much for um, the presentation. It's a practice that we still practice here in Fiji, um, the the burying of uh, of one's placenta. Anyway, uh, I wanted to. I mean, it's it's a a practice we still practice here in Fiji is the burial of our umbilical cord. And so the relationship with the Vanua is, uh, I've, I found some similarities in, in that in your speech. My question is uh, more about how one of the midwives spoke of, uh, I think the word used was shame uh, in, in, in terms of her, of showing her vagina or the doctor having access to that personal space. Uh, my question is, uh, where did, if you could expand a little bit, if you, if you would, on on where that came from, and if it was really shame, or if it was fear, and if there was a, a, some hit more around fear uh, in that interaction, or if the midwife spoke about the interactions uh, with with the doctors. Thank you. Yes. So this comes from conversations that the Patera had with uh, the, the women, their, their patients, um, expecting, not just expecting mothers, but um, Chamorro women in general. And um, so it, it, it was um, real feelings of, of shame, but there's no denying that there was also uh, fear um, not not just because uh, the hospital, um, you know, they they were regarded as uh, you go, you're going to come out sick when you go there. So looking at these spaces as, as sites of of illness and death, but also uh, there, you know, there some of the women talked about um, the stigma attached to, you know, if they were having babies and they weren't married, and this was something that the Navy was also hard on. Um, Mm -hmm. and, and uh, worked, uh, worked hard and, and actually ordered, had orders that actually prohibited um, the cohabitation. Uh, so, the, so there was fear. There was actual mm -hmm. fear as well. Barbara, um, you had a question. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Tina. Um, I really enjoyed the talk. I'm about halfway through the book and I have been just raving about it because I've been found so much to say. 
about it. Um, so my question is maybe a bit tangential to the talk today, although you did have the image of the, the lay midwives and the, the new midwives, the nurse midwives. And, you know, that there's, it's striking the kind of, um, the image there of youth, youth and newness and modernization and the kind of, um, the, I guess, the, the dream of, the administration of kind of creating a new kind of um, Chamorro woman. Um, and I wondered if if you could say a little bit more about how or to what extent that view of, you know, I guess I, I would imagine that some of the Navy side or the American side of um, the view of youth would be that oh, the, the old lay midwives, whatever other characteristics they had were harder to change or didn't have, um, you know, up-to-date knowledge or, you know, weren't hygienic, things like that. Um, but what was, to what extent was that out of sync with the Chamorro understanding of age and women's relationship to, you know, reproductive knowledge? And um, was there, a, was there a, a, you know, a, a tension there between the American view of women's life cycle and the potential for for doing a good kind of reproductive work as midwives if that makes sense yeah i, th I think so I, I so um well first of all there 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 were there were tensions um and some of the midwives that i interviewed uh spoke of these um in in terms of how the navy regarded uh Basically, um, they're they're in Chamorro context, their their relatives, their kin, and their their sina, the Chamorro term for elder, um, and and um, you know um, sina or manamco senior citizens are highly revered in Guam, and so this was a this caused a lot of tensions uh, with the with the midwives. Um, some of them didn't really want to talk about, you know, when they were talking about their experiences and they came close to divulging, um, you know, one of the problems, some of the problems that um, the women were having in delivering, you know, they also had to be careful uh, because talking about a certain midwife, midwife from one village would, uh, you know, it wouldn't take much to go and find out who that midwife was. So they, they were very careful about uh, but they were, they were also, they also, when I talked about bringing together, together Chamorro practices with the Navy's methods uh, and, and combining or hybridizing them, um, they were, they, they were also adamant that, that there were certain practices that the mid, that older lay midwives needed to be more flexible on and and um they were critical of them so it was it was a combination of uh treading very carefully with respect for their for their elders or families the elder you know the an auntie for example or a godmother um i think you you had a did that did that answer your question you had something about term um in the context of re, reproductive health right yeah, just thinking about the, I, that did answer my question, thank you. Um, the idea of, um, you know, what young people, maybe younger women who maybe haven't had children yet or have not had as many children as some of the, the senior um, lay midwives, the idea of whether they could be as, as good at the work of midwifery as some of the elder women were and whether um, that personal relationship to reproduction was, was seen as relevant um, in both the kind of worldviews. But that, yeah, that, that did answer my question about um, balancing the kind of desire to be respectful to elders and kin and also while not giving up the criticism um, that the, some of the the nurse midwives had of, of some of the inflexibility of the older generation. 
Thank you. Thanks for that question, Barbara. Um, <clears throat> Anne Hattori was going to ask a question, but um, there's also a question from Leah as well, Leah Louis Chavez. Okay, yeah, Anne's had a student pop in, so she apologizes. Uh, Leah. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you, Tina. That was fascinating. I really look forward to reading your book. Um, like um, Ariella has said, uh, I'm from the Torres Strait Islands where the practice I know of burying um, the umbilical cord uh, certainly continued up until the 60s um, and maybe continues still today. But I had a question, it's something that impacts across the Torres Strait and I guess very strongly in other parts of the Pacific, it was the impact of, of missionaries on the on um yeah on the practices of women if you could say anything about that thanks so i so um i can talk about in so um early the spanish under the spanish period um there's I've not come across a whole lot uh, in terms of childbirthing practices. I mean, that was something I was really, um, in the book, I, 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 I talk about um, a different kind of placental politics. And these are refer historical references to, to, to Chamorro women aborting their babies under US colonialism. Uh, as a way of uh, uh, not wanting to subject them to, to a life under tyranny. And so, um, I mean, this, you know, as you can imagine that this gets really difficult to talk about in, in the context of a very heavily uh, Catholic <laughs> community in Guam. Uh, but uh, these are, these, there are references to, um, to, to women um, aborting their babies, uh, their infants, but there are also references to um, in one of the first ethnographies on the island. So not quite missionary, but um, we know that these are age old practices, um, the use of certain kinds of medicines and um, the, the missionaries uh, under Spanish colonialism, uh, there was an effort to really thwart the power of women, um, but you know, with specific reference to birthing practices, um, I you know I don't I'm not really seeing that uh, a whole lot. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that, Tina. Yeah, you're welcome. Um. Okay. Any any other comments or questions? Does the cat have a question? <laughs> I'm sorry, my cat has become a Zoom star since <laughs> March of 2022. She's always here. I'm thinking too, um, I know Anne popped out uh, and yeah. maybe Leona, Leona um, may be able to jog my memory here, but um, around birthing, during Spanish, uh, the Spanish missionary period. I haven't come across anything. <laughs> and yeah. if you haven't, yeah. And, and Leona has done some work with the Spanish uh, documents. Uh, if anything, I've seen some references to the need to procreate um, because of the dwindling population in Guam or just the um, some, I think there's like a royal decree from Spain or something like that where um, there's concern about falling birth rates and they didn't want women to work in the garrisons that maybe that could help things if they just like worked less and stayed at home more. Um, but Anne's back. <laughs> Sorry, it's a teaching day. Um, well, not about birthing, but just general comments from the Spanish that they felt Chamorro women had this mistaken idea of power and freedom and that they needed to teach women, you know, that basically to control the, the power of the female, uh, especially because they had female chiefs, right? That, that, that was something they were not uh, happy with. So, and consequently in historical accounts, you just don't see women's names in the Spanish mm -hmm. era. 
you can read 200 years of documents, very, very rare to find a single woman's name. It's just, they just, <laughs> so that's a very clear, I think, sign also just how they treated women as historical subjects, right? But in very terms true. of birthing, yeah, not. The search continues, <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. If I could jump back in here, because I, um, bringing up Spanish is really significant for the Torres Strait because it's De Prado and Torres who go through there in 1606. And one of the things they do at the very end of that voyage is um, they steal three women from one of the central islands, one of whom is heavily pregnant. And um, in the journal, there's a description of her giving birth um, on board the the boat as they're taking these women with them across towards, um, I suppose, modern day Timor into that area. Um, and then it's like they disappear, these three women who were taken kind of disappear. Um, so somewhere their story is kind of buried in, in the kind of in the archives. Um, but yeah, just bringing up the Spanish and kind of Catholic missionaries is, uh, is really, it's different to the in the Torres Strait because it was predominantly the London Missionary Society and that's a whole other yeah, a whole other kettle, but um, but yeah, but thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for that question. Excellent. Um, okay, well, unless we have any more discussion or comments, Tina, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation, and um. Wish you all the all the very best of luck. Uh, you've got teaching. Um, you're back to teaching now, aren't you? I am. Yeah, lucky you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, but also with your future research project. Um, so uh, that was fantastic. And thank you to all our participants um, for your great comments. Um, I'd just like to now draw your attention to our next webinar, which will be on the 13th of October. And that will be at, again, we had to change the time to suit the participants, 11 a.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time. And this will be a USP, University of the South Pacific Student Research Roundup in honour of the late Bridge Lull. Um, the students aren't necessarily doing research um, in connection with Bridge, but uh, we wanted to honour his passing. And also, it's very close to Fiji's uh, Independence Day. So um, Nick Holter is going to chair that session. And I think it'll be great to hear some of the, post the wonderful postgraduate work that's coming out of USP. But once again, um, Thank you, Helen, for your technical support. You, 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 you know, you, you, you've got a future here. And, um, <laughs> and, and uh, everybody have a great day and um, look forward to seeing you next month. Okay, bye. Thank you, everyone. That was so terrific, Tina. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed that. Very interesting and really inspiring. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, no, it was great. Yeah. Thanks. And it's, yeah. it's I also appreciate that it's getting near, you know, it's getting near your sort of winding down time, okay. um, the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably, thank you. You probably got your domestic goddess duties to perform. <laughs> That's right. No, everybody ordered pizza, I think, because I said, nope, uh, shop's <laughs> closed, shop's <laughs> closed. <laughs> but I'm looking forward, I really hope again to see uh, you both, um, fingers crossed, next BHA. Yeah. Oh, yes. I, we're, yeah. yeah, we're really looking forward to it. I'm really enjoying, I'm, I'm pretty involved in the planning for it. And um, yeah, actually, just the presentation today, I was thinking through, okay, who can I make sure that we've got and who should we be making sure is invited? So, yeah, that was really helpful, actually, for me to kind of think through those those who, who really must be present at the next PHA to make sure that it's, you know, inclusive. Might be, 
and yeah, yeah. inclusive and yeah got all sorts of stuff with it yeah, yeah. I mean, some, of that, some of that, uh, the Torres Strait. Uh, yeah, I know. I was thinking, Leah, we must. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Places, yeah. That would be that would be great. Yeah, we're we're trying to get funding at the moment because we've got a new government here to um, try and bring, you know, a good number of people from PNG and Solomon Islands and and maybe Vanuatu as well because they're the people we just can't get. They they just don't have the funds. They don't have the. Hey, don't forget the Eastern Pacific. We, the Eastern Pacific is always much better represented than Melanesia. I know. So really, that's, yeah, I don't know. I don't yeah. remember the last time we had a PNG scholar. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, so we, we really want, we, we're really keen to get Melanesia better represented at the PHA. Yeah, that would be great. I know that's one of the things I appreciate about um, the Australian Pacific Studies Conference. Because yeah, the last yeah. time I attended, yeah, there were a few people from uh, Melanesia, and I was Good. excited about that. So, yeah. no, that's right. No, that's right. Well, yeah. So it, we, we, yeah, I think it's going to be great. Looking for, and I'm enjoying. It's one of the beauties. I'm now retired, so I can do these things which I enjoy so much more <laughs> because I'm not trying to fit them in around teaching and stuff. So that's yeah. working well. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we should probably let you go, Tina, and um, sort out your grab your own pizza. <laughs> oh, they're, yeah, probably, they're, they're probably all gobbled it up. They'll have finished it by now. <laughs> 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 okay, see you. Bye, Jackie. Bye.